Let's start with the warm-up. First question, what histological findings are seen in alcoholic hepatitis? So fatty infiltration is a common finding, although it's not specific for alcoholic hepatitis. NAFLD and NASH can also cause fatty infiltration. You can see Mallory bodies, which are intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusions, but again, these are not specific for alcoholic hepatitis. They can also be seen in alcoholic cirrhosis, Wilson's disease, primary biliary cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. But they're most commonly seen in patients with alcoholic liver disease. Then you might also see necrosis and swelling of the hepatocytes. Next, why is cough one of the common side effects of ACE inhibitors, but not angiotensin receptor blockers? ACE inhibitors and ARBs both act on the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, but they act at different points in the pathway. ACE inhibitors work by inhibiting angiotensin-converting enzyme, so that there's less angiotensin II circulating. But angiotensin-converting enzyme also breaks down bradykinin. So when you inhibit angiotensin-converting enzyme, there's more bradykinin circulating, and that can cause that nagging cough. Now, ARBs don't cause a cough because they don't inhibit angiotensin-converting enzyme. So bradykinin levels are going to remain normal, and angiotensin II levels remain normal as well. But ARBs block the angiotensin receptors. So that's it for the warm-up. Let's go ahead and get started with the lecture. Hi, welcome back. This is the last of the lectures on research studies in epidemiology and biostatistics, and we've already covered a ton of extremely high-yield four- and five-star topics. This video is no different. Let's start with standard deviation and standard error. This is a high yield section. Specifically, I think it's important to understand the concept of a normal or Gaussian distribution, standard deviation, and standard error. So let's go over that now. A normal distribution or Gaussian distribution looks like a perfect bell curve. With this distribution, one standard deviation on each side of the mean contains 68% of the population. Two standard deviations on either side of the mean contain 95% of the population, and three standard deviations on either side of the mean contain 99.7% of the population, which is nearly 100%. So these are numbers that I think would be good for you to know, 68, 95, and 99%. So what is standard error of the mean? If we say that n equals sample size, that sigma equals standard deviation, and SEM equals standard error of the mean, then when we calculate SEM, that's sigma over the square root of n. This equation will be important for calculating your confidence intervals in just a moment. Just looking at that equation, you can see that you get the standard error of the mean by dividing the standard deviation by something. Because of this, you would expect the standard error of the mean to be less than the standard deviation. Another thing that you can see by looking at this equation is that the standard error of the mean decreases as n increases, which makes sense. The standard error of the mean goes down as you increase your sample size. One thing that you need to recognize here and remember is that there is a difference between the standard deviation and the standard error of the mean. They sound a lot alike, so don't confuse them. The standard deviation describes the variation of values within one sample of the population. The standard error of the mean describes the variation of sample means from that of the true population mean. So you need to know that these represent two different numbers, but they are both used to calculate the confidence interval. Okay, so what is a confidence interval? Let's say you performed a study on a sample of 1,000 people. In that study, drug X increased life expectancy by six months. Now, what would, you, what would happen if you repeated that same study where you sampled another 1,000 people? Well, chances are that you would obtain a slightly different result, but it shouldn't be too different, right? Well, what we're talking about here is the confidence interval. Now, when you designed that study, I'm sure you were careful to plan it well, so that you would be very confident that the final calculation of increased life expectancy would be a good approximation of the true value. But because the study was done on a mere sample of the population and not the entire population, then it's unlikely that that calculated value is the true value. Obviously, it would be impossible for us to put the entire population through the study to try to determine the true value. So the confidence interval is a range of values within which we would expect to find the true value if we were gonna sample the entire population. Now, the confidence interval can be calculated to reflect different levels of confidence. If you wanted to be 90% confident that the true value was contained within the confidence interval, then the confidence interval would contain fewer numbers. 
That's to say, that interval would be narrower. Now, if you wanted to be more certain that the true value was contained within the interval, you would want, you would want to increase the confidence level to, say, 99%. And this would cause the range of numbers to be broader in order to, be, to include more of the possible values. Now, let's take a look at how we determine the confidence interval. Well, the equation for confidence interval, or CI, is CI equals the mean minus Z times the standard error of the mean all the way to the mean plus Z times the standard error of the mean. So what is Z? Z is a constant that is specific to the confidence interval that you're trying to calculate. If you want to set your confidence interval at 90%, then you would choose a Z of 1.645. If you want to calculate a 95% interval, then you would use a Z of 1.96, which you could round up to two for simplicity's sake. And if you want to, ca to calculate a 99% confidence interval, then you would use a Z of 2.57. You can see that as you increase your confidence intervals from 90% to 95% to 99%, your Z value would increase from 1.645 to 1.96 to 2.57. And because of Z's place in that confidence interval equation, you will see that as your confidence level goes from 90 to 95 to 99%, the confidence interval itself becomes broader and broader. So just to reiterate, how do we calculate the confidence interval? Well, the confidence interval equals the mean minus z times the standard error of the mean all the way to the mean plus z times the standard error of the mean. And again, what's z? Well, it depends on the range that you want to calculate. For a 90% confidence interval, you'd use a z of 1.645. For a confidence interval of 95%, you would use a z of 1.96 or 2, just to make it simple. And if you want to set a confidence interval of 99%, then you're going to use that Z of 2.57. Now let's look at this con confidence interval in an example. Say that there is a study that takes a group of middle-aged men and randomly assigns them into one of two groups. Group A is given a strict low cholesterol diet and group B is the control group where each person eats what they would like. Those on diet A have five cardiac events per 1,000 person years, and those on diet B have seven cardiac events per 1,000 person years. Now, what is given here is the rate of adverse outcome in the exposed group and the unexposed group. Now, we can compare these rates in different ways. We can use a rate or risk difference, where we subtract the rate of the unexposed from that of the exposed, in this case, the risk difference would be 5 minus 7, which equals negative 2. So in this case, exposure to the new diet decreased the incidence of cardiac events compared to the control group. So the rate difference is less than zero. This demonstrates a favorable impact of the exposure. By this measure, it looks like the diet is a great protector against a cardiac event. So what if we calculate a 95% confidence interval, and it shows a confidence interval of negative 5 to, to 1. What does this tell us? It tells us that we're 95% certain that the true value of the difference in rates is somewhere between negative 5 and 1. So what's the problem here? Do you see how that confidence interval crosses 0? So this is telling you that the true difference between the rates will be either in the positive or the negative direction, or it could just be 0, where there's no difference at all between the two groups. The rates of adverse events was then the same in the exposed group and the unexposed group, indicating that the study intervention didn't affect outcome at all. When we say that the study intervention has no effect on the outcome, what are we saying? We're saying that we have to accept the null hypothesis, that there's no association between the intervention and the outcome. Now, what if the study outcome is the same, but we decide to use a rate or risk ratio instead of a rate or risk difference? In this case, the equation is rate of the exposed over rate of the unexposed. When we do this, the rate or risk ratio is 5 over 7, so 0.7. So if the rate of adverse outcome is less in the exposed than in the unexposed, then the rate ratio will be less than 1. If the risk is greater in the exposed than in the unexposed, then we'll have a rate ratio greater than 1. Now, what if the rates of adverse outcomes were exactly the same in the exposed and the unexposed groups? This leads to a ratio of 1, and it supports the null hypothesis. What if you were to calculate the confidence interval of this rate ratio and you saw that it was 0.3 to 1.7? What would you conclude? Well, if you're calculating a confidence interval 
for a risk or rate ratio and the confidence interval crosses one, then you conclude that there's a reasonable chance that the true value of the rate ratio or risk ratio is one. If there's a reasonable chance that there's no difference between the two groups, then an investigator cannot reject the null hypothesis and the study would have to conclude that the study data did not show an association between the exposure or intervention and the outcome. Okay, before we go any farther, let's work through some practice questions together in your study guide. What is the equation for determining the confidence interval? Remember that the confidence interval is the mean plus or minus z times the standard error of the mean. And what is z? It depends on which confidence interval you're trying to calculate. For a 90% confidence interval, z is 1.645. For a 95% confidence interval, that z value is 1.96. And for a 99% confidence interval, the z is 2.57. And then how do we calculate the standard error of the mean? Remember that the standard error of the mean is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size of the study. And you need that to answer the next question. Now in a study of USMLE scores at a particular medical school, the mean score from a random sample of 100 students is 230 and the standard deviation is 20. Now calculate the 95% confidence interval. Here the standard error of the mean equals the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So that would be 20 divided by the square root of 100, or 20 divided by 10, which is 2. So the standard error of the mean is 2. And here we're going to round that z of 1.96 up to 2 in order to just simplify this calculation. So again, the formula for confidence interval is the mean plus or minus z times the standard error of the mean. So we have 230 minus 2 times 2, or 230 minus 4, which is 226. And on the other side, we have 230 plus 2 times 2, or 230 plus 4, which equals 234. So the 95% confidence interval for this study is 226 to 234. Okay, so the next two questions are related to the previous question. What is the 99% confidence interval in the same study? So we're gonna use the same standard error of the mean, which was two, and the same mean score of 230, but instead of calculating a 95% confidence interval, we'll be calculating a 99% confidence interval. So instead of using two as our z, we're going to use 2.5. You remember that the formula for confidence interval is the mean plus or minus z times the standard error of the mean. So now we have 230 minus 2 times 2.5, or 230 minus 5, which is 225. And on the other side, we have 230 plus 2 times 2.5, or 230 plus 5, which equals 235. So the 99% confidence interval for this study is 225 to 235. So what this example is trying to reiterate to you is that as you increase your confidence level, you're gonna widen your confidence interval. Next, in a study of USMLE scores at a particular medical school, the mean score from a random sample of 16 students is 230, and the standard deviation is 20. Calculate the 95% confidence interval. Okay, so first we need to calculate the standard error of the mean, and to get the standard error of the mean here, take the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 16. So we take the standard deviation of 20, and we divide it by the square root of 16, and so that's 20 divided by 4, which equals 5. So the standard error of the mean here is 5. Now again, I want you to remember that the formula for confidence interval is the mean plus or minus z times the standard error of the mean. And we'll be using a z of 2 since we're calculating the 95% confidence interval. So now we have 230 minus 2 times 5, or 230 minus 10, which is 220. And on the other side, we have 230 plus 2 times 5, or 230 plus 10, which is 240. So the 95% confidence interval for this sample of 16 students is 220 to 240. And so what we're trying to reiterate to you here is that with a smaller sample size, the confidence interval will broaden. When you have a larger sample size, your confidence interval for any given confidence level will be narrower.
All right, the rest of the material I'm going to cover in this video is not as high yield as the other statistics topics that we've already covered, but they're still fair game for step one. They do still show up on tests from time to time. So let's take a little time to go over them now. First step is the t-test. The student t-test is a way to compare means of two groups when the study data are continuous variables. So if you're comparing the average weight of men versus the average weight of women within a certain population, weight is a continuous variable and a mean can be calculated. A t-test can then be used to compare the means of two groups. That's really all that you need to know about the t-test. ANOVA is basically the same thing as a t-test and that it can be used to detect differences between the means of different groups that use continuous variables. But instead of looking at just two groups, you're looking at more than two groups. You're looking at three or more groups. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance, and it's used to detect a difference between the means of three or more groups. It's like a complicated t-test. The chi-square test can be used to determine the difference between percentages or proportions of categorical outcomes, not mean values, in two or more groups. Anytime that you look at a study and see a two by two table, a two by three table, a three by four table of data points, think of chi-square analysis. The t-test and ANOVA are used to analyze mean values of continuous variables. Chi-square is used to evaluate categorical or discrete variables like male versus female, disease versus no disease, defined age groups like 15 to 20, 20 to 25, 25 to 30, something like that. There are, these are all categorical variables which can be evaluated using the chi-square test. Okay, now let's talk about the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient, designated by a small r, looks at two variables in your study and determines the relationship between those two variables. So you might be looking at the prevalence of smoking and the incidence of lung cancer. You might notice that as the prevalence of smoking goes up, the incidence of lung cancer also goes up. This would be a positive correlation because as X increases, Y increases. Now, say you're looking at physical fitness and coronary artery disease. You might notice that as physical fitness increases, incidence of MI decreases. This would be a negative correlation. As X increases, Y decreases. So the correlation coefficient can be calculated to measure the relationship of those variables to each other. The value for the correlation coefficient will fall somewhere between one and negative one. The closer the absolute value of the coefficient is to one, the stronger the correlation between the two variables. An R of 1 indicates perfect correlation between the two variables, whereas an R of 0 indicates that there's no relationship between the two variables. If the correlation coefficient is greater than 0, that is, it's a positive number, then the relationship is a positive correlation. If the correlation coefficient is less than 0, a negative number, then the relationship is a negative correlation. And again, if that correlation coefficient is 0, there's no correlation between those two variables. So the correlation coefficient R describes the strength and the direction of a relationship between two variables. Now there's a related term called the coefficient of determination, or R squared. This is a measure of goodness of fit. What the R squared value does is describe how well the statistical model, or regression line, reflects the actual data or observed values. So again, R squared describes how good of a fit there is between the study model or regression line and the observed data points. This R squared value, the coefficient of determination, is the one that you're going to see more frequently reported in published studies. All right, I think that we've reached the end of this lecture. I hope it wasn't too overwhelming. And just by listening to what was said here and doing those study guide problems, you've been exposed to a lot of high yield information for your step one test. So what I want you to do now is pause the video, answer the end of session quiz questions, and then restart the video so we can go over the answers together. All right, let's go through these answers. First question, in a normal Gaussian curve, what percentage of the sample population falls one standard deviation, two standard deviations, and three standard deviations from the mean? So remember that one standard deviation on either side of the mean includes 68% of the population, two standard deviations includes 95% of the population, and three standard deviations is 99.7% of the population, or practically 100%. Next, what is the equation for determining the confidence interval? Confidence interval equals the mean plus or minus z times the standard error of the mean. Next, in a study of diabetic patients on drug mecholeca liver, the average patient hemoglobin A1c after three months is eight, 
and the standard deviation is 0.5. Knowing that the sample size is 10,000, calculate the 99% confidence interval. So you have your equation for confidence interval in the question above. So first we need to calculate the standard error of the mean. Now the standard error of the mean equals the standard deviation, which we were given, divided by the square root of the sample size n. So the square root of 10,000 is 100. So standard deviation divided by 100 equals 0 0.005. So the standard error of the mean is 0 0.005. And you might think, wow, that's a really small number. And that's not much error, but that's because the sample size is so huge. So go back to your equation for confidence interval. We were given the mean, and now we've got the standard error of 0 0.005. And for a 99% confidence interval, remember that the z is going to be approximately 2.5. So z times the standard error of the mean is 2.5 times 0 0.005, which is 0 0.0125. So the 99% confidence interval would be 8.0 plus or minus 0 0.0125. That's the end of the end of session quiz, and that's the end of our lecture on confidence interval. I'll see you next time.